Hi everyone, this week we're talking about process-based practices. So um, this will connect to our workshops this week and next week. Um, you're welcome to watch it before the workshops or after, or um, depending, it's in three parts. So the first part will be sonotypes, photograms, and then about digital um digital photography sort of this idea of the pixel versus light based um, image making so you're welcome to watch it either you know in parts or in one go um but we will refer back to this um this content and um it's more about these these three parts will be more about sort of looking at artists work and processes and hearing from artists so I've got a lot of YouTube links um, in here as well, but I'm uploading this PDF so you can click on the link directly to the PDF on the Negro Faith course content. So it should be very accessible there. But the idea is that I want you to hear from artists talking about their processes and their way of, of working, because in the next two weeks, you're going to be experimenting with the process and different ways of working. So this goes back to something we discuss quite often, this idea of practice-led research. And it's the idea that you compose, reflect, and recompose. So this is cyclic process that we mention quite often to you. Um, and this is a great example I've taken from Martin um, to share with you here. So it says um, it's about these three distinct methods for research. So it's about four, into, and through. So the first four refers to the researcher who is involved in investigations with a specific application in mind. So which lens is best for shooting tigers in the jungle? And then the second um, distinct thing to think about is into. So this historical or theoretical examination it's been going into. So um, what has been conducted to find standards. So um, now you have photographs to potato tigers. What effects have come out of, to what effects have happened? Um, and then the through takes this idea about art design process to establish a method or a methodology. So that's the whole through. So through photographing tigers, a unique direction was developed. So from that, that you know, that, that outcome, you would go back to the start again and sort of um, do this sort of process of thinking, making, reflecting on the making, um, and kind of going to a next step again. So the idea that in process, you're experimenting, you're testing things, you're trying things, and you're reflecting them. Um, and, you know, through this, you're still researching, you're still being worried, you're still sort of planning, having ideas, but you never know how the outcomes could change or shift, and you're open to that. So, as I mentioned, um, we're going to be looking at this idea of light to pixels. So, um, this first part will focus on light in the terms of sound types. Um, and light in photography is such a crucial aspect of making an image. Um, a photographic image is produced by the action of light on light-sensitive material. <clears throat> Traditionally, that would be photosensitive paper or film. Um, now with your cameras, it's light going through with the sensor. Um, and we're really thinking about this in terms of very much physical light um, and that physical connection with light through sonotypes and photograms. So either darkroom light or a UV light, such as sunlight, um, to produce an image. So um, in the two weeks, one of the sort of workshops you'll be doing is on sonotypes. I also have put um, a lot of information for here for anyone who can't attend the workshops. Um, I want you to have the opportunity to understand the processes and ways of working. Sonotypes are really great because you can get um, pre-mixed chemicals or solutions that um, you can use at home or pre-coated paper. You can get it from the internet very easily or um, an art shop usually just call ahead. But um, I wanted to sort of let you know that this is very accessible and do doable um, for you to continue at home in your own time. Um, and that um, you still have this information access that um, we'll be going through in class as well. So cyanotypes are a photographic process, a printing process that produces a cyan blue print. 
Um, engineers used this process into the 20th century as a simple and low-cost process to produce copies of drawings referred to as blueprints and um, uses two main chemicals, so a solution A and a solution B, which is ferric ammonium citrate um, and then potassium ferrocyanide. And those are mixed with um, different ratios of water depending to get these solutions and equal parts A and B mixed in. I sort of just wanted to let you know as well that in the course content there is a folder called Cyanotypes which have um, these basic instructions about cyanotypes and toning and tinting as well. So this is a very simple just instructional video of someone working through at home and um, if you're going to do this at home I thought it would be a really nice way to see how um, much chemicals this person is using on the print. So they're just putting a very thin, even layer. Um, and how they do it, it's a very simple process. It's just, um, it's great to see someone do it. So here's a YouTube link here for that. So basically the process is photochemicals um, reacting together to forming this intense blue. Um, and throughout this process, um, you can see in this image, for example, how the color changes from this sort of like greeny yellow color um, to when you put it in UV light, where it kind of comes this sort of bluish grayish green. And then when you fix it, so you wash off all the chemicals, so um, the print stops exposing with UV light, you want to wash all those chemicals away. And then um, the print will start turning this blue color and as it dries it should become a darker blue and this all depends on um, exposure times which is very dependent on um, light so for example if it's a cloudy day versus a sunny day are you in a humid location or not what kind of paper are you using how thick is it how do the um, how does the paper impact your exposure times and these are different things you'll learn and think about. And part of the process of doing this is writing down and noting the differences in day or time or paper or um, how much of certain chemicals you know, you've mixed the balance to understand um, yourself, what you're doing and, and what works best in your terms of your process. Um, so, you know, this first day when you coat it, you need to dry it in the dark. So make sure there's no UV light. Um, once it's dry, you want to put it um, against something flat, um, put, you know, your negative or positive or any objects you want to put on and then um, put something like Perspex or um, a glass sheet on top to hold it flat. And then you just put it in that UV light um, once it's exposed for your sort of predicted tested time. You know, you might do a couple of tests to kind of work out what's the best exposure time depending on the day, but that might shift with the weather as well. Then you'll bring it back in um, or take it out of that UV light and wash those chemicals away, as I've, as I've said. And there's lots of information available on how to do this, including in that course content. Um, and through this process, you know, you're not sort of stuck with just this blue, which is beautiful blue, but you can um, tint it and sort of tone it with bleach um, and tea and coffee and wine because tannins have a real effect on this um, toning. You can also use fabric as well and depending on what materials and um, what fibres, how they absorb the chemicals and different things like that will have different impacts. Um, also there's things to consider in terms of longevity um, and what your printing you know what you're putting these chemicals onto and what you're trying to produce so that was just a sort of basic overview of how to do it um and what we're going to do next is to sort of talk about the historical um how some types came about what they were used for and contemporary artists who are working in this medium so the cyanotype process was invented by astronomer and chemist john friedrich william herschel um, British man, um, and this was sort of 1800s, and he experimented with the cyanotype process in the 1840s, inspired by Anna Atkins, um, who's visible in this picture here, a daughter of his friend, um, and they worked together to produce this um, botanical studies with cyanotype photograms, and hers was what you could call the first photo book um, published at the time. Um, so the cyanotype process was 
not used very often until the 1880s when it be people sort of realised it was a much cheaper proofing process for collodion dry gelatin plates and gelatin roll film before final printing, which is quite an expensive process. Um, and this like silver and the platinum based photographic processes, more expensive materials. Whereas they found that this idea of the blueprints or this kind of test print was the affordable way to work. So it wasn't something that people were using in its own right as um, a considered medium. Um, you know, so from 1870s about until 1950s, um, the cyanotype processes and various um, variants were used by engineers and architect architects to copy plants. So we can see here um, one of Anna Atkins' works, and she's extremely well known for her cyanotypes and her botanical scientific record keepings of these specimens. Very of that, you know. 800s, 1900s, this whole sort of science Victorian period, um, and she produces scientific reference book, British Algae, Cyanotype Impressions, um, and it was, you know, first to use light sensitive materials to illustrate a book. Um, so she learned about this process um, through correspondence with the, you know, with William Henry Fox Talbot, and she owned a camera, but for her, the cameraless technique allowed her to produce these botanical images with these different details. Um, and she was sort of looking at as a way of specimen and documenting and this idea of cyanotype photogenic drawings. Um, and so she, she learned this method from um, Sir John Herschel. And moving away from this sort of very didactic, scientific way of thinking about cyanotypes, I want to show you quite different approaches um, how, people, how artists have responded from that time period. Um, and artists have used it to print, you know, photographs, their negatives or positives um, using um, film or using transparencies. You can do that yourself, print on acetate and then um, expose onto the coated paper. But I wanted to show you more experimental approaches to this. So German photographer Marco Brewer a lot of his work is produced without a camera, aperture film. So this idea of this cameraless, lensless, photographic process. So he, he uses photograms and also abrasive, incisive techniques on photo paper and different methods. So he works in and outside the dark room, exposing photographic material to heat, light, and physical abrasion. Um, you know, like he's used 12 gauge shotguns electric frying pan, modified turntables, razor blades, power sanders. Um, and he sort of, you know, worked from chromogenic paper to black and white photograms, photograms, silk screens, all kinds of different things. But for him, it's very much about the process of making um, and being very interested and passionate about that process rather than other things around it. And we can see how quite different um, artists approaching this idea of process and what they're kind of getting out and what they're interested in. So for him it's the method and technique and experimenting with those techniques um, is what he's thinking about. Christian Markley um, is an artist who's quite interested in the crossovers between art, film and like music, popular music culture. Um, so he made this series of photograms photograms with music cassette tapes that he dis disassembled. Um, and as you can see, I'll sort of go through the different works in his series, you can see this very didactic here, you know it's a cassette tape. I hope you all know what a cassette tape is. But here um, you can tell what the object is. And the thing about a photogram, or you know, the sunny taps, they're playing with this um, negative and positive space. So um, where the object or, you know, um, whatever is covering the paper, the coated paper, where it's very dense or opaque, um, it should be white, so that's where that object is. And where there is transparency, um, you know, and you can sort of see this transparency or see through the object, that's when you're getting um, these darker colours or where the, the paper is not covered by density or by an object, you can see um, these vivid blues. So you can see here with the cassette tapes, there's different levels of transparency with the cassette, cassettes. And um, you can see the casings versus the reels. And as you can see here, um, um, 
how how that's how that's working, how that's looking. But all this like it's becoming more abstract. It looks more like a Pollock. It looks more like a painting. Um, this idea of what you expect it to be or what you imagine it to be is quite different. And they're quite large works here. So he's on my unwind the spoons of the the spools of the cassette tapes and proceeded to draw with the reams of tape sort of thrown around doing multiple exposures so he's like putting some there and taking away because the exposure is from the UV so he has some control of that if he's doing it in a studio versus outside um so this idea of abstraction through this object but this sort of processed way of working um, and here again, you know, it becomes less, much less clear what the initial object he is working with, but how important is it? And you can see how he's titled the works as well um, for him and his thinking process of, um, of you know, why he's working with the photogram or why he's working with these objects. Um, and you, you're probably sort of thinking right now there's a lot of... Um, like uh, similarities to an x-ray and that's kind of if you think about scans if you think about photographs it's all playing with light so this is um i thought a great photograph of how he produced the work you know working with assistants in a university here um to a system producing these large prints you know you can see it's quite vivid blue already here um so this idea for him it's about the visual landscape within sound within a sheet in this physical and material form And then we have another artist also working with sanitimes and very, very much about the process of making. So Megan Reipenhoff, um, she says here that the, the elements that I employ in the process, waves, rain, wind and sediment, leave physical inscriptions through direct contact with photographic materials. So you might be able to tell what it is through the title, but also the um, description she gave here. It's physical exposure and chemical reaction with the ocean and with the wind and with the sun and with the sand. So there's minerals on the sand, there's salt in the ocean. There are all these different things coming in which um, are impacting that physical print and the chemicals in there. So they're having a chemical reaction. Um, and you can see they're quite large. Um, and also, you know, the works here, like she often titles them a specific time and place and moment. So this idea that the location about when it's made and the time was made, that process for her is a big part of the work itself. Um, and she only partially fixes the work of a certain type. So she, that, that sort of, she only um, removes some of the chemicals. So there's still some chemicals there which continue to react to UV light and their surroundings. Um, so for her, it's the idea that a print is a living thing and that it's unstable and it will change and mutate over time, which is like an archivist nightmare. Um, so she's challenging the idea that a photograph is fixed in time in a sense, um, although it is, you know, it has been fixed in time, but it's still morphing through that. And here is like a great photograph of her um, producing the work. And you can see that, the paper is on a top, she has an assistant, um, it looks very intense, but you can see it's an overcast day, so she must be exposing the work for quite some time um, to produce the results that she wants. Um, so it's quite interesting when you think about how many times has she done this to figure out what she needs to do or to have her understanding herself about um, you know, how many tests or how many experiments has she done to get to this point in her practice to understand this or produce this result and I expect a lot and she's still refining it I'm sure um so there's a a little just short one minute video of her talking about her practice that I do recommend um you watching um this link will be in the pdf document so you can just click on it and it will take you to the youtube account I recommend just like having the pdf document open because there's quite a few links I'll um include uh, in here and so then a very I've wanted to show a very different um, way of working Tali Hughes is a QCA lecturer and she's a painter predominantly known for her painting um, working with this idea of the feminine here she's sort of like de Kooning's woman um, and she's taken her paintings and printed them onto acetate and then produced sanitypes from them 
which look like collage assemblages or photo montages or this mixture of drawing or painting kind of infusing that. So this relationship between printmaking and the cyanotype is, is very strong and something to consider about. Um, but it's a photogram. Is it a photograph? Is it a painting anymore? How does that shift? Um, and it's something to think about, you know, her process for her is about her research and idea, connecting back to her painting and why she has done this. Um, and then we have Seth Fal Fal Sean Farland's work. I keep saying Seth, you know why. But Sean Farland's work, so sorry. I was trying to Google him earlier and it was like writing Seth instead of Sean. Um, so he looks at the sort of relationship between photography and landscape, which is pretty clear in this image here. Um, but he's very experimental in terms of how he works and how he works in the studio and how much of his work is premeditated or not and how he comes to it. So he really enjoys working with failures or slippages um, and then coming back to works and revisiting them and thinking about them and thinking about constructions or how things can be viewed after a fact that you may, may not realise at a time. So he works with rocks, he works with bottle caps, he works with coins, um, he just works with the prints themselves, all through this process of cyanotypes. So I've got two short videos of his that I'm going to include here um, that I think are really fantastic. And I re if you're going to watch anything, I would recommend you watch these two videos because the way he talks about process and experimentation, I think is going to be very helpful for your own thinking and your own thinking in terms of these two workshops coming up. I've got to put the time in this one, but I think it's like, it's not very long. Um, oh, I think I've actually put it in twice, so I have. So um, again, this link is in the PDF. You can, um, I might try and add these as well. Um, so he just he's just going through how he works and how he works in his studio, but how he works with these objects and the materiality and the physicality. Um, so they're quite two different short ones. This is two minutes, this is four minutes, but I very much recommend um, watching them um, when you finish up this lot. So the next um, part, part two, is on photograms. So you can take a break, watch those links I put in there and come back to the photograms one. You can go back to it later. Um, but it's up to you.